Got it. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, so, like I said, my name is Candice. I'm the outreach lead for this project. Um, today, we want to give an overview of the Melrose Promenade Project and review our preliminary construction plans for the Pike Pine block specifically. Um, again, these are really early plans. They're subject to change, but we wanted to share them with you now so that you can have an idea on what to expect, what construction might look like, um, share any potential concerns with us that you might have so we can start coordinating with you on some of the details of construction. Um, we'll also share information on how we plan to stay coordinated with you during construction. Um, we'll share some other contacts and resources um, as well. Our real goal is to make this be as useful for you all as possible. So please um, feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, you can put your questions into the chat box. Um, you can also click on the button at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand. Um, Drew, who is here and part of our outreach team, is helping keep an eye on those questions um, and the queue of raised hands. So Drew will help us kind of pause along the way and make sure that we um, give space for you guys to ask your questions. So he'll call on you to ask your question if you have your hand raised, or he'll read your question out loud if you put it in the chat. Um, and if folks can just keep themselves muted when you're not speaking, that would be really helpful. So we limit background noise. Um, and let's see, before we start with introductions, again, I just wanna thank you all who have been engaged on this project for many years throughout design um, and as we've worked to prepare for construction um, and welcome to any folks who are here for the first time. We're just really thankful that you're here. Um, we know that many of you have been longtime champions for this project and we just really appreciate your continued partnership to deliver it. Um, so let's see, with that, Drew, do you wanna do roll call on our team for introductions? Great, well, before I start roll call, I'll just introduce myself. I am Drew Ninehus. I am uh, supporting Candice in outreach and communications through the design and construction process. And I'll kick it off first to Marilyn. Hi, everybody. I'm Marilyn Yim. I am the project manager with SDOT, uh, sticking with this project through design and construction all the way. Thanks, Marilyn. Uh, next up, Lai. Uh, Lai is muted right now. Okay, sorry. I'm Lai Pham. I'm a SDOT construction engineer. I oversee the project during construction. Thanks, Lai. Robert. Hello, I'm Robert Hallowell. I'm gonna be the resident engineer on the project. I'm gonna be the one primarily coordinating between SDOT, the community and the contractor to get everything built. Thanks, Robert. Lencio, Lorenzo. Hi everyone, I'm Lorenzo Dustchuk. Um, I am the design, design project engineer with SDOT. And AJ. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, AJ Kari, Office of Economic Development, um, helping out with the outreach and the messaging and resources from the OED side. Um, and apologies, I have to drop off for a, another 1.30 call. Uh, also, just another note too, um, my uh, colleague Jonas Seifu, uh, is who couldn't make it today because he had a baby over the weekend, but he's another point of contact um, uh, for the project. Uh, and as another unnamed person at this point, as we started out some staffing, so. Thanks. Thanks, AJ. And Catherine. Um, my name is Catherine. I am an SDOT intern with the outreach communications team, but also part-time employee at Scotch and Soda from time to time. So I'm sort of on both sides of this whole thing. Thank you. And it looks like we have Bruno here and McKenna from Scotch and Soda, Linda from Terra Plata, Forrest from Glasswing, and Julie from Bowman Associates, and Jerry, I forget if you, which organization you're with. 
Uh, <clears throat> I'm property owner at uh, 300 East Pine there, uh, Pine and Melrose Corner with uh, the Groff Murphy uh, Law Firm. Excellent. Welcome. Oh, and also the other one at, six, at 300 East Pike Street that has uh, the six arms in it. So I guess both those buildings are impacted. Excellent. And ah, Chris Ruiz from SPU is also here. Chris, if you want to do a quick intro. Sure. Uh, my name is Chris Ruiz. I'm with Seattle Public Utilities uh, on the solid waste uh, compliance and inspection side. Uh, so I'd be working with uh, the contractors of ecology and waste management to ensure uh, during this time period that uh, solid waste collections uh, resume as normal and that we don't have too many issues with the businesses that uh, might have uh, services affected during the construction period. Thank you all and welcome. Candice, I'll hand it back to you. Okay, am I unmuted now? <laughs> Thanks, Drew. Um, oh, and everybody, um, again, great great to have you all. Um, so I'll start with a quick reminder on SDOT's vision, mission, and values. So our mission is to deliver a transportation system that provides safe and affordable access to places and opportunities. And our key values are around equity, safety, mobility, sustainability, livability, and excellence. And now I'll dive in with an overview of the Melrose Promenade Project. This is um, probably information that many of you have seen before, but it maybe has been a while, so we wanted to just spend some time going over it. Um, again, the purpose of this project really is to help improve safety conditions and safety for people biking and walking. And again, it's also part of building the community's vision for an actual promenade here. Um, so the project limits are from about University Street to the south um, up to Roy Street at the northern edge. Um, the project includes building new bike lanes between Pine and Denny, which on this map, and I know it's kind of hard to see, um, but this is on our webpage and we can send around a link, but protected, bi protected bike lanes here from Pine and Denny. Um, the project also includes some key intersection improvements at the intersections of Pike Pine, Denny, and Olive. So I'll review those next. Okay. Um, so starting here up at um, the intersection, here's Pine Street, here's Pike and Melrose, where many of, oh, where many of you are. Um, up at Pine, we are installing some new curb ramps. You can see here in the blue, um, we are doing some curb bulbs. So kind of bumping out from the curbs to make more of a bulb shape. We'll be building a new raised community crosswalk here. So again, it'll have that same um, community design that exists today, but the crosswalk will be slightly raised up, which helps with slowing traffic. Um, the moving down then the west side sidewalk will be widened um it will be about 12 feet wide and then here in the um about center of the block there'll be an even wider section that section will be about 16 feet wide um the widened sidewalk here will really help um with mobility for people. It's really high trafficked area. And as I'm sure you guys know, folks have to cross single file a lot of times. So the widened sidewalk will help um, create more better mobility there for people. Um, let's see, the curb bulb will also have some features like street trees and a bike rack. Um, also on the block here, we are relocating several loading zones and we tried to label those. And again, um, we can send this out to you all after this meeting so you can see this more clearly. Um, but there will be a new handicapped parking spot here um, at the north end of the block. We are relocating some commercial loading zones. The concept here really is to mostly just relocate what already exists out there. Um, so those loading zones will just be a little bit further to the south than where they are today. 
Um, there'll be another commercial loading zone here on the other side of the street. Um, then moving further south, the three minute passenger loading zone that exists today will be um, is designed to be about here, directly south of this curb bulb location. Um, there's plans to include um, the existing commercial loading zone that's here right now. And then on the east side of the street, again, we have relocated um, this, this loading zone here is existing. To the south of that will be a relocated passenger loading zone. And then beneath that is a relocated commercial loading zone. Um, let's see, the, again, we have more curb bulbs here and curb ramps shown in blue. Um, a big feature of this project is the new raised intersection here at Pike and Melrose and Weiner. So that um, raised um, that raised intersection really actually kind of puts people up a little bit on a pedestal. It'll, it will have scored concrete. Those are all kind of signals to drivers to slow down and that this is really a place for people. Again, we'll have another um, community crosswalk here that will also be in the raised intersection. So also raised. Um, the travel lanes here on the block will be slightly more, they'll be slightly narrowed. Um, we also are getting rid, there won't be a center line painted on the street. Um, it'll still be, the current plan is to still have it be two-way traffic here, um, but without the painted center line, there will be two-way painted um, bike share of symbols. So all of those treatments, kind of the, the narrower lanes, the bike markings, the raised intersections are all measures that will kind of help slow traffic, signify to people driving that this is really a place for people walking and biking and rolling. Um, and hopefully will help with um, cut through traffic of people trying to access I-5. Um, we, we've heard, um, we know that there's a sign here right now that says no turn, no left turns onto Melrose. And we've heard from you all that that sign is rarely followed. And so we are also looking into what changes we could make to that sign to make it more visible. Um, I'll pause to see if we have any questions on this area before I move to the next. We do have a couple of questions. Um, the first one about the commercial loading zone in front of Terra Plata, the location of it, and possibility of sw swapping that for a three-minute passenger loading zone. Yeah, so um, I think that there's some flexibility here in where all of these loading zones are located. Um, and it's a conversation that we can have with the SDOT street use team that really dictates that. Um, Marilyn and Lorenzo, do either of you have anything else you want to add about the loading zones and their current locations? Candace, this is Linda. Can I just give a little history? Of oh, yeah. Um, hi. <laughs> Thanks for, thanks for this meeting and thanks for um, including us in all the conversation. But the, so the, the commercial loading zone that's right in front of our space, we actually instigated that. And we had initially asked for a passenger loading zone and it was, lit it was just a, a cross up of communication and the city and SDOT ended up installing a com com commercial loading zone instead. And at the time we're like, well, we'll just live with it for a while and see how it works. Um, people use it more for a passenger loading zone than commercial and commercial loading zone. It's not the very end of a block because it stops in the middle of the block. And that's a really dangerous location anyway, because people cross the street there as it is. And when there's a big truck that pulls up there, um, they have to take their, whatever they're delivering for us and um, for all of the tenants in our building um, halfway down the street um, to where the uh, lobby back entrance is to receive deliveries for all of us in that building. And the passenger load zone is right in front of that lobby door where everybody receives deliveries. 
And it's problematic also because big trucks block the visual for cars coming up minor. It blocks the front door of our restaurant. And typically because people are picking up coffee for Starbucks there and there's passenger cars in that loads on most of the time, even though there shouldn't be, they end up double parking in the middle of the street. And because Monum Streetery is across the street, it literally blocks traffic. So I think that what we initially asked for, which is what we could have got a long time ago, um, would be better um, for a passenger loading zone. And I know that there's challenges that normally you put commercial loading zones at the end of the block, but I would vote to have it either where the passenger loading zone is or see if everybody can rely on the one across the street that's already there in the plans. Or as another idea is to move it across the street or on minor if minor is wide enough, but that's just a horrible spot for a commercial loading zone. For all of those reasons. Yeah, thanks, Linda. And um, it's really problematic. Um, so this is Marilyn. I just unmuted myself, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> that's a lot. <laughs> I was taking notes while you were talking, Linda. Um, so we, let's see, what I, hear, what I heard there was a couple of things um, in terms of like location of load zones, uh, visibility at the intersection, um, um, non-compliance with the assigned use, um, and just generally like a lot of competing, you know, you know, a lot of uses for the same space. And so um, kind of two things that I was thinking about was number one, about the assignment of the space, who, who how it's supposed to be used. Um, so we, uh, the group that Candace is talking about is the, um, the public space management group. They um, do generally do the parking management for the city. And so, um, so we can set up a meeting to have them come in and evaluate that. Um, what I understand, what I understand is that that one end space is actually, it's kind of both. It's not a commercial loading zone and it's not a passenger loading zone. It's a, um, oh, Lawrence, you, you might want to correct me on this one. It's actually can be both. Um, and so that might be a little bit, some of the confusion is that, you know, I'm sure passengers want to use it, but it also can be used by trucks. And then you're also noting the, um, the site distance issues that it's blocking visibility. So um, I think that those are all uh, important issues for the curb, the park, public space management folks to, you know, take an assessment of and evaluate, you know, um, to kind of figure out what, where those things should go and how the space can be best used um, with the needs that are, that are present. And then the other thing is kind of, once that's sorted out, is also the um, violations of it. I'm thinking enforcement. And so I wanted to kind of bring that up too. I'm kind of curious to hear what the um, business owners and property owners on this block, what you all think about, um, you know, parking enforcement, if that's an issue or a need on this block, like right now before we even begin construction. Because I know we've all gone through COVID where it wasn't happening, right? It was very much just like, there's a lot of other things going on in the city right now. And so par uh, um, streets, you know, people weren't getting parking tickets, right? people weren't getting towed and that kind of thing. Um, but now that's kind of starting to come back. And so I'm wondering if you're starting to see kind of an uptick of a need for, um, you know, for parking enforcement to come in and just sort of like, you know, get people more complying with what the um, designated usages of those spaces are. So if I could just follow up on what you said and then get everyone else's input, of course, um, I don't want to take up all the time here, but one of the biggest reasons that you didn't reiterate also for it to move down is the uh, two reasons. One, uh, I think most importantly, forest at Glasswing, um, there's even an entrance into um, still liquor on that side. Mm -hmm. that, there's that door where all the garbage is by the parking meter in the middle of the block. Mm -hmm. And still liquor, Glasswing, Taylor Shellfish, and us receive all of our deliveries through that door. Um, and that is, it's like 
half of the business is on that block. And right now, by not having it in front of that door, the, even though all the reasons why it's bad at, up at our point, I think is um, also it would be better if, if deliveries were where we receive deliveries. And for aesthetics and everything too, our back entrance is like our alley, so to speak. And that's where our garbage goes. That's where all of the things that maybe are less pretty goes and, and where we receive our deliveries. And to me, that's where loading zone makes the most sense. Um, and it's because we're the, everything loading zone, it's a 15 minute, 24 seven yellow curb loading zone. So um, it is being used mostly, honestly, the biggest use is for people to get coffee at Starbucks. So I'd love to include what passenger pickup and loading zones are on minor and at the end on Pike, um, because that's part of the whole big picture also. And in answer to your uh, question about parking enforcement, we desperately need it. Mostly cars park there and stay there when they shouldn't. In my opinion, we need better parking enforcement. Okay. Um, um, we can we can call for parking enforcement for sure and make sure that they are, you know, um, ask them to make special visits <laughs> at this block. I don't want anyone to be surprised when that, if that happens. And I do, and, and I'm nobody else is speaking up, so I, I'm assuming that it's all right with everyone else. Um, but if we do that, we can let you know. There you go. Okay, I'm seeing a force is writing. Um, we can let you know before that happens because um, I totally hear you, and and I think that there is a need. You know, oftentimes if 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 restrictions and things are if parking is really being abused, then sometimes that's necessary. Um, but on the other hand, I also don't want like you know your employees to be getting the tickets because that when they come in, they will just they will you know they will ticket whatever's there. They don't know who owns the car. It will just be whatever's there. And so I'd like to if we do do that, I'd like to um, give you guys a heads up that that's going to be coming. Um, so if that's, I'm sorry, I'm reading too. <laughs> um, so if that's something that we, uh, agree should, you know, is a need, then we can definitely do that. And just all, we can let you know when to expect that. So that hopefully, uh, nobody who, uh, has gotten accustomed to using it, <laughs> that you have a chance to, to, um, pull a car out of there and avoid the ticket. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm just reading the comments as they're coming in too. Um, anything else to add on that particular question? Forrest, I know you had a question similar, so um, if there's no other comments from our team on that, I'll just kick it over to Forrest to see if you had anything to add to your question about loading zones on Pike, on the Melrose section. And then also kind of like transitioning into where Candace is gonna go next with the presentation. Um, you're going to be seeing some areas where there will be no parking during construction. And it's going to be really important when we have those, these are the temporary easels that are for no parking for construction projects. Um, it's going to be really important that people um, respect those. And um, we, because that's in order to provide space for the contractor to work. And we really don't want to be towing vehicles. And so um, again, we're going to continue communicating with you about that. But that's something that I just I just wanted to just put out there that uh, when the contractor is going to be working and the no parks are there, um, we would really prefer not. And we'll do a lot to try and avoid towing vehicles, but it could get to a point where if, if um, people are just continuing to park there, then that may happen. So I just wanted to kind of preface the prep as we're getting into this um, to show you how we're going to be using the space. And there's going to be a lot going on at that time when we begin to work. Thank you. Um, sorry, just checking in for us real quick. I just want to make sure, did you have anything else to add to the to kind of the loading zone question before I move on to the next question? Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, for Forrest. He had mentioned, Forrest, you had mentioned yes. um, about right after Linda, the non-commercial load zones, are they being removed from Melrose between Pike and Pine? Um, so Marilyn or address it that. Look, it looks like there's a little bit of 
flexibility on whether there's going to be a commercial load zone or a three minute load zone. And I was curious if this curb bulb covers up the door or goes past the door moving south uh, or if it stops just before it. Because I, I agree with Linda, having, having the commercial load zone be as close to that door would be the most functional and the safest because that corner is a, a real dangerous pedestrian area um, right in front of the Terra Plata entrance. So to put a large box truck on that corner creates a, a bunch of different problems that I think we could avoid. Thank you for um, from our team, anyone have any comments on that question? Or uh, comments on those comments? All right. Yeah, I, Drew, this is Candace. Um, I think that this is something that um, we can go back and take a look at with the um, public, space, public space management team. Um, I think what I'm hearing is general interest to perhaps even swap the locations of this commercial loading zone so it's closer here to the actual spot where the businesses are loading and there's interest in changing this loading zone here to be more perhaps like a three minute passenger load zone that would um, at least prohibit large trucks from using it that would address the safety visibility concern that Linda brought up. Um, Marilyn and Lorenzo, is that fair? Is that something that we could go back and, and talk with public space management about? Yeah, definitely. That's on the table for sure. We'll talk. Um, just, just to be clear, um, that's, so that's uh, another group at SDOT that manages this, but we are very happy to, you know, bring them in and have that conversation in, you know, while we're um, meeting with you guys and, and working things out with our project too. Yeah, I would add to that, uh, you know, what, what we were trying to do here is to keep the load zones as, as close to existing as possible. So yeah, we, we weren't looking to relocate unless we know that there is a desire to do that. So now we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at that and see uh, if that's possible. With, we'll, we'll work with our curb space management. Right. Um, I just put in the chat, there's a question about whether the Melrose section through here between Pike and Pine will remain two-way. Um, just, yes, it will remain two-way without the center line stripe down. Um, so. Thanks, Drew. Are there any other questions to address or should I move on to the next intersection? I think we can move on. Linda, I see you have another question here. Well, we can loop back to that one in a moment, but I think for now we can pop on to the next one. Okay. Um, so next, I want to point out what's happening here um, at Melrose and Olive. Um, again, we're installing new curb ramps and curb bulbs. Um, a key design feature here is that we're adding this um, improved crosswalk on the west side of the street. Um, we're simplifying this crossing so it's safer and more pedestrian friendly. Um, we're kind of straightening it out and then this curb bulb here in the center is kind of like a pedestrian island um, so folks can get across and then get across again. Um, and these curb bulbs also essentially kind of um, straighten or kind of make the, the entrance more of like a corner, a little bit of a tighter angle which will slow down cars um, and also help with, with pedestrian safety there. Um, and then lastly, I'll point out up here at Denny, so a little further north, again, our big intersection improvements are building these curb bulbs and curb ramps and repainting um, crosswalks. Um, up here, we're also adding some back-end angle parking north of Denny and the intent of that is to really kind of make better use of the space and fit in more spots. Um, we're also up here adding a new restricted park residential parking zone. Um, so that will restrict parking of these spots to residents and short-term visitors. Um, and then 
Throughout the project, we're also um, making some pavement repairs, adding some speed humps and pavement markings. Um, most of that pavement repair, the speed humps are here in this segment north of Denny, where the concrete panels are pretty damaged. Um, and we want to improve those as part of the new neighborhood greenway that's going in with this project. Um, so are there any other questions or comments about project design before we move on? Uh, I, I just want to say that uh, I want to thank you for your uh, for all the work that you've done. It's always it's always great. I think that uh, I can't wait to see the work started. Um, I wanted to reiterate that you know, like that, uh, no left turn from uh, from Pike is going to be really critical. I see a lot of cars turning there and almost hitting uh, uh, bikes that are coming down on on Pike. Uh, so I think that 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 will be uh, that will be a good thing to really uh, to really enforce. Um, I thought that the raised um, intersection on Minor Pike and Melrose was going to be that the whole thing was going to be painted like the crosswalk. Uh, that's not the case anymore, or was it? Maybe it was never the case. I can answer that, uh, Bruno. Um, it's the plan is not to have it painted, but it will have uh, like a, a colored concrete and texture. So it would look more like a like a red brick uh, texture over the entire oh. intersection. And then only the crosswalk will be painted with the, exist the same as existing. Okay, great. Uh, and then I, I wanted to let you know, I've, I've had more discussions with uh, with the city about the lighting. I haven't fully given up on getting lighting on Melrose. Um, so when when you widen the side the sidewalk on the on the west side, um, I think that there are already um, conduits in the sidewalk. I don't know if there are any opportunities to connect to those conduits where lights could potentially go in the in the future. Uh, while we do this work, uh, that that would be that would be a, a, a great um, improvement, I think. And um, a few more questions is that we we had talked about at least making the street one way during construction to faci facilitate things. I don't know if that's still uh, a possibility. And then the one last thing I wanted to say is uh, at Olive, uh, at the Olive intersection, I think it'd be very important to make sure that the cars that are coming down Olive that want to turn onto I-5, that they cannot turn on red uh, there because I've seen a lot of cars doing that. I drive through there and I bike through there a lot. And it's amazing the number of cars that don't seem to understand that they could make a right turn onto Melrose, but not go through the intersection to get on I-5. So mm -hmm. uh, having a sign that reminds people of that would, might be a, a good safety addition. I think that's it. Thanks. Bruno, um, I can speak to your comments about um, making Melrose one way during construction. That is um, at parts or at points of construction part of the contractor's plan, and we'll get into that later in the presentation. So I'll, I'll table that one for a few slides from now. Um, your question about lighting, Marilyn, is there anything you're able to say about that? Yeah, I was actually unmuting myself for that. Um, so uh, yeah, we've heard that Bruno, thank you for bringing that up. Um, we are currently um, evaluating that both from like a constructability perspective and cost perspective. So we're looking at it right now. No final decision yet, but we are definitely looking at it. All right. Thank you, that, that's great news. I appreciate that, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then I imagine, Marilyn, we could also look into the question about putting a no turn on red sign. 
I was kind of looking at Laurentia. Do we have that in there right now or no? So I understand. Was that for um, if somebody is traveling south on Olive or no, not south? Uh, I think that would it's be southbound on Melrose. Southbound on Melrose on ramp. But like the no right turn on red. Do we have that right now or? Yeah, it would be it would be for people traveling west on Olive, right? That they west on Olive. Oh, yeah, and they 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 see the entrance to I five that looks like a right turn. So yeah. they they basically don't realize that they would have to cross Melrose to make that right turn, and so they think that it's it's legal to do, and uh, it's it's really bad, especially for bicycles coming coming across. Yeah, so I think that the project would actually address that just because we're realigning the the on ramp. So if you look at the graphic, it's not gonna it's not gonna look like a right turn anymore, as much as it is today. So it should be more obvious that that movement is not a right turn um, after this project. But we'll look to see if additional signage is needed. But um, yeah, if you see it, I think it would it would look like that's a through movement uh, with the new realignment. Yeah. Yeah, because right now you're right, Bruno, um, the way that the current intersection is configured, it's kind of like a, a weird five-way intersection and the crosswalk um, goes kind of in a weird diagonal kind mm -hmm. of. Um, sort of following that westbound movement so that it does look like you're turning right against that crosswalk. And so the way that we're laying it out, and thank you for zooming in, Candace, it's it's a much more of a, a four-legged four intersection square. And so the layout should communicate that that is not a right turn movement. But yeah, like Lorenzo said, that's something we'll definitely be watching for. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Great. I'm just going to give us a quick time check because we do want to make sure we can get into some more of the um, trend, the control plans for during construction and kind of what to expect. But before we move on from this one, I just we got a quick question from Jerry here. Just conf can we confirm that the existing curb cuts will remain? And then as to your question on is there more detailed changes between Melrose uh, on Melrose between Pine and Denny, we can definitely get some more graphics there for you. Or if Candace is able to do a quick overview of those changes. Thanks. Thanks, Drew. I, I can answer, I think, and Lorenzo chime in, but any, we wouldn't be removing, I don't think we're removing any existing curb ramps. We might be replacing some of them, um, but our goal is to obviously have them at, at every curb. Um, and then, yes, why don't we table the details on design up at Denny? If we don't get to, we can, if we have time at the end of the presentation today, we could come back to that or we can follow up with you, Jerry, separately and, and help answer the questions that you have about that area. Does that work for the sake of time? Yeah, no, that's fine. And and I just want to confirm that, uh, you know, sort of all of our driveways into parking lots and that sort of stuff, all, all of that stays the same in in this. Yeah, I would, I would say, yeah, all the driveways remain the same. Okay, great. It'll be interesting to see details of how some of those things uh, relate to the bike lanes and um, thinking about sort of safety of exiting the drives uh, with the bike lanes there. But I mean, honestly, there's bikes there already. <laughs> They're just not in marked lanes. So hopefully this is all will all be an improvement for safety. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks, Jerry. Um, Okay, I'm gonna keep us moving then. Um, so project updates, um, we've hired a construction contractor. It is CA Carey. Um, we have their very early plans. So everything that I'm gonna share from this point on is part of that early plan. And just please remember that they're preliminary plans, they're subject to change. But again, we wanted to share this information with you now. Um, so we expect that construction will start either late this month or more likely early February um, and continue into fall. Um, we expect that they'll start north um, up near Roy and that they will be here working in the Pike Pine block 
um, in April and May. And actually that the slide says that it'll start April, April or May, but really they'll be doing the construction in April or and May um, with the goal to be completed by June. Um, and we think they'll certainly be out of here and done with this area by the 4th of July. Um, the main variable that they're working up against is weather. Um, since much of the work on this block is concrete work, um, they need dry, warmer temperatures. Um, so that's the big, the biggest issue in our schedule variability there. But the, the hope is that the work will happen in April, May. Hopefully goal to be done by June, but we think they'll at least be done by the 4th of July. Um, a lot of the work that they'll be doing is, is the pavement and concrete work, as I mentioned, um, and they might come back later in the project to do um, some of the finishing touches like the street trees and um, some pavement markings. So it might be that there are some temporary pavement markings um, for a little bit and then they'll come back and do the rest later um, once we have the materials that are needed for some of the specialized markings like the community crosswalks. Um, and so since um, we know several of you have, several of the businesses have um, temporary permits for streeteries on this block, and we really wanna work with you to be able to keep those streeteries in operation as long as possible and up until the contractor needs this area. Once the contractor's working here, obviously um, the streeteries won't be able to be in operation because this will be a construction zone. Um, but again, we want to work with you to be able to um, keep them in operation as long as possible. So we've already started some one-on-one -on -one conversations with businesses that have um, streeteries. And if there's anybody else here on this call who has a use like that, that you're interested in running um, up until the work starts here, please just reach out to us and we will coordinate with you on that. Um, I'm going to keep going. So what to expect during construction? So I'm going to start by talking just generally what people can expect for the project. Um, so typical work hours will be weekdays from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. with some occasional nighttime and weekend work. But however, in order to minimize impacts to you all, the, the Pike Pine businesses, we're not planning on any weekend closures for the Pike Pine block. And we're also restricting construction on key festival weekends like Pride and Capitol Hill Block Party. Um, we will maintain pedestrian access to residences and buildings at all times. There will be temporary closures and detours for people driving, walking, and biking. We'll have signed detours um, whenever there are closures. Um, and then typical construction activities, folks can expect some noise, dust, and vibrations. Um, and there will also be some construction equipment staged throughout the work area while um, workers are working in a particular location. Um, so then to talk will more you, uh, can I say, will, will you send notices when the, the streets will, will, will be closed, maybe a few days before or? Yeah, so we will do, um, and I'll get into this into the presentation, but um, we will have regular, like probably weekly email updates that we'll send to our project listserv. So in those email updates, we'll let folks know what they can expect. So that would include information about like where closures, streets are going to be closed and where people can expect detours. Um, so we'll communicate with the general public that way. And then um, we also plan to, to kind of have uh, meetings with you all, the businesses, to review those plans also in detail. So you're just really clear on um, what will be open and, and where access will be restricted at times. And we'll talk more about that um, in future slides here. Um, so, the construction on the Pike Pine block, again, these are very preliminary plans that might change, but our goal here is to really manage construction in a way that responds to a lot of the feedback that we've heard from you all previously. Um, so we have heard a preference for a shorter, more intensive construction period versus a longer, less intensive construction schedule. 
Um, so that's what we'll do. And our goal is really to help the contractor work as efficiently as possible to kind of get in and get out. Um, as I mentioned, we're restricting closures on weekends and major festivals on this block. Um, crews also typically don't work on national holidays like the 4th of July, so we expect those periods to be quiet. Um, there will be temporary disruptions to existing loading areas. Um, and so to manage that, we really want to better understand your specific needs so we can coordinate um, with the contractor on access plans that help them do the construction, but also helps you all continue to operate your businesses um, in, a, a, in a way that's as least disruptive as possible. So um, we did send around a survey along with the invitation to this meeting um, that tries to ask some of that specific information from you all. So thanks to those of you who have taken that survey to let us know what your needs are. We can send it around again um, and please um, um, fill out that survey so that we can better understand those needs and that will help us work with the contractor to kind of finalize um, those plans for how we'll manage everything during construction. Um, we are coordinating with SPU and they're here today um, to talk about, uh, to figure out trash collection during these periods of construction. So that'll be another thing that we'll circle back with you all on, but know that we're coordinating it and we're working on it. Um, we will maintain access to Melrose Ave at all times, um, although there will be some restrictions. So pedestrian access will always be maintained, um, but there will be some sidewalk and cross crossing closures. Um, we will put out those businesses are open signs, um, and we're looking into doing some custom signs that also list the names of all the businesses on the back of it to just help promote visibility for you all um, during construction. Vehicle access will also be maintained at either end, so either through Pike or Pine, um, although through movements at some point will be restricted, such as during short-term closures, and I'll go into all of that more next. Um, we do not anticipate needing any utility shutoffs for the work on this block, um, but if something changes or if the emergency unforeseen situation arises, we will certainly let you know as soon as possible. You'll receive a notice um, several days in advance of any utility shutoffs that might be needed, but again, they're not in the current plans and we don't think that they will be required. So next, I'm going to get into the details of the construction plans, but I'll just pause quick. Drew, are there any questions or raise hands to address? None in the chat, um, but if anyone has a, a question, now is the time to speak up. Uh, there's, uh, we don't have anybody from the Melrose Market, uh, you know, like like the uh, Rain Shadow Meat and, and, and even Homegrown. But I'm wondering if during the construction, if it would be possible to have maybe some temporary 15 minute uh, uh, zone or parking spots on Pine, maybe right in front of Machiavelli to so that people could easily then, you know, park, go get, uh, go buy something and then, and then, uh, and then leave because a lot of their business is, is like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Marilyn, does that seem like, that seems like to me something we could look into. What do you think? Um, I wrote that down on my notes. That is a good idea. <laughs> um, no, that's exactly the kind of thing that we want to hear about. Uh, what what kinds of, of um, needs that you have for, you know, ongoing access for deliveries, for customers, whatever. Um, we will try to accommodate on Melrose as much as we possibly can, but you're right. We may potentially have to shift some of that stuff out to Pine or Pike, depending on what the contractor is doing at the time. So, um, but we definitely want to hear, yeah, absolutely. Please highlight those kinds of things that need to be, um, the, the purposes and uses that need to be accommodated. The other thing would be to, to talk to Starbucks because they have those uh, tour groups that come and uh, on you know with big buses and I know that they have a parking area on minor but you know still maneuvering a bus like that it's it's going to be disruptive so right yeah we've yeah. we've been in communication so far they don't have like a, a schedule of tour buses but yeah we definitely want to know as soon as they know 
um, when those things are coming, because I imagine that they do get some communication from the cruise ships or wherever they come from. Um, so yeah, uh, give us as much, well, if you, if you see or detect or know of something that changes that could be in conflict, like let us know, and we want to be able to work those things out. Okay. I'm going to keep us moving. Um, so next I'll review these preliminary plans for construction. Once again, emphasize these are just um, preliminary plans and they may change, but we hope it's useful. Um, so you can start to visualize what construction might look like. And then as Marilyn said, help um, give us information about what your access needs are and just your customer needs are so that um, we can coordinate those things during these periods of construction. So um, this uh, graphic here on the screen is what it might look like when the contractor is working on the west side of Melrose Ave. So that again is mostly um, sidewalk and curb ramps and they may also um, do work for the raised intersection at this time. Um, so what you can see here in orange, these are kind of general work areas. Um, we will be restricting parking during this time, so anticipate restricting parking on both sides of Melrose Ave and then um, restricting parking on minor. Um, during this time, it'll be local access only, so we'll have signs out indicating that and we'll have um, uniform police officers out and flaggers also helping um, with the local access. And again, a lot of that is for your deliveries. Um, so, at this stage, um, minor ab because they, the contractor might be doing work here at the intersection, we anticipate that minor ab would be closed. So there wouldn't be through traffic allowed on minor. Um, we anticipate that the contractor could do this phase allowing through traffic on Melrose, but again, it would be assisted with flaggers. Um, Let's see. Oh, and then again, just the, as Marilyn mentioned, kind of just the importance of the no park here. That will be especially like on minor when the road is closed. Um, and for you all to facilitate your deliveries, um, we'll need the space for trucks to be able to kind of get in, make that movement to turn around and come back out. Um, same thing for just contractors working in the area, which is why those no parks will be so important and will need to be enforced. I'll just pause for a minute because I know this is a new graphic um, and we can send this presentation around to you all after so you can take a look at this um, in more detail. But are there any initial questions or comments? So to be sure that I didn't miss anything, so there'd be no parking anywhere for the two months of construction? Well, I'll let Robert actually maybe chime in. This graphic, Bruno, is just showing when the contractor is doing work on the west side of the street. We, we think the contractor might kind of do this in three phases, that they work on the west side of the street, the east side of the street, and then the, fa and then the, the raised intersection. And all of that work would happen over that two month span. We don't quite know exactly how they'll sync with it. They might come up with a more efficient way to phase all that work. So this configuration here is showing when they're working on the west side of the street. Candace, when does the, on that block in particular, when does construction start and stop again? I was under the impression that it was two weeks, not two months. That they were gonna do, each section was, to, the, like that, that block was gonna take two weeks, not two months, and that that's when this, that's when parking would be shut down. Yeah, I think that the, hope is that it could be like two weeks but again the the main variable here is just weather and so it's kind of that two month period that we think the contractor will be doing this work um it could go faster if we're blessed with warm weather and dry weather um but maybe robert i'll hand it over to you robert or Lai, if either of you want to talk about this sequencing anymore then yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, I can talk on this. Um, again, Robert Hollowell. Um, we do not have the contractor's exact plan at this moment. The contractor's been hired. 
they having to share with of all of our plans. We have our initial design plans, our initial phasing on how we expect this might go. So we, this is the graphics we're sharing with you today. This is one of the possible things. CA Carry might come up with a, a complete plan that says, okay, we're gonna be in and out of here in so many days, depending on what we have you know, for weather. And it, the, the intersection improve or the raising of the intersection, that's gonna be two weeks in it by itself because we have to uh, save and protect a lot of the existing brick in that area. So it's gonna be a very careful excavation for continuously for a few days um, that I believe is on the next graphic if you wanna progress to the next one. <clears throat> uh, so they're gonna be saving and protecting all the brick in, in that area. They got to then raise it, you know, place fill in there, and then they got to make the roads meet in both directions, or actually all three directions, before they can and put it in in concrete. And concrete itself takes a couple days to uh, set so that you have, uh, it can be bare traffic again. And we're going to be doing a, a design in here, so that always slows things down rather than just doing a, um, a straight, um, uh, straight flat uh, roadway with some tine markings on it, you know, like you see uh, for concrete panels in other places. So the sidewalk work and the reason why we're having all the parking restrictions and it'll be primarily during daytime hours, you know, it'd be the um, probably the seven to five hours that you saw there. Nighttime hours should not be affected, you know, and the parking sign should reflect that. There may still be some construction equipment that needs to stay there. Like uh, we pour our concrete slurry into eco pans. It doesn't make sense for them to pick up a quarter full eco pan every, every evening. So it's gonna stay there for several days during a phase. So there's things like that. Um, I think I hit it and like I said, these parking scenarios are the worst the case, and it's more so that your people can get in and back out again. Like on this graphic here for Minor Avenue, since it's closed, people will have to come up Minor Avenue, and then they're gonna have to turn around somehow. And with the park, with cars parked all along there, you won't be able to turn around. And, and we, could possibly look at having a UPO back like larger vehicles out if they came up minor somehow, but you know, you know, share the resources from up the street. And and I'll just add, Linda, to address your question. I think once we get final plans from the contractor, we'll be able to give you all more information on exactly how long we think this will take. Again, that two month span of April to May is just the two month span when we anticipate the contractor doing this work. And I think the, the major concern is, uh, you know, that you close the street and block all the parking and then the weather goes bad and it takes, you know, another week and uh, before work can resume and during that entire time, even though no work is being done, there is no parking. And that always, you know, makes it very difficult on the on, on the businesses. So I think that it's it's again uh, communication will be key and also flexibility. If it looks like no work is going to be done for a while, then maybe reopening the street would, would make a lot of sense. Ab absolutely. That is definitely what I would want them to do is if they know they're not going to be working for three days in a section, you know, remove the no parking signs and, you know, go back to normal for a little bit as much as normal can be as long as it's safe for the community and, you know, safe for the contractor. Mm -hmm. Well, we do have to, Robert, we do have to balance out though. I mean, re removing the no parks is one thing, but then they have to have you know, a minimum of 24 hours notice when we put them back in, usually we give 72 hours notice. And so, you know, giving three days of notice means that that may not give us as much flexibility, you know, again, balancing all that out, I guess it depends on how much of a gap there would be between, you know, periods of work. Um, if it's going to be close together with one day in between, we probably wouldn't necessarily remove the no parks, but 
um, just because of that, you know, continuity. Again, I wouldn't want somebody to get their car caught there thinking, oh, I didn't think you were working. You know what I mean? Um, so it's, it's, it's hard. We have to kind of balance that with making sure that people understand what is going on, what is happening and, and don't, don't get um, surprised, a bad surprise. And then the other thing too, I could just kind of wanted to mention is that um, I think it's, and, and you can confirm or not, Robert, uh, I think it's very likely that, you know, when there's cones and barrels going on up here and we're about to start work, um, that that stuff is likely to remain in place from day to day. Um, so yes, I, I, I totally uh, hear and appreciate what Robert's saying about wanting to be as flexible as possible and allowing um, use of the space, but um, the contractor will not necessarily be like taking everything down and having no sign of, no, no orange barrels and no sign of co construction at the end of the day. It will probably be there at the end of the day so that they can resume work the next day. So I just kind of want to set that out there as, as what this will look like once we do begin work. I'm having a little bit, of, I'd have to say I'm having a little bit of PTSD right now because when Starbucks did their construction, um, there were several nights where we lost, you know, seven to $10,000 on each shift because of the impacts of their uh, equipment, their trucks and having the street closed off like in the same exact manner that it is, but minor wasn't even closed and it still affected us that badly. And so if we're looking at two months of street closure, we're looking at a huge revenue loss that is would be pretty massive and debilitating for us right now. Um, um, it's, it's, sorry to interrupt you, Linda. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm just knowing what happened to us before this is bigger and even more closure. So anyway, I'm just curious, does, does Minor and Melrose have to be closed at the same time? Um, well, uh, Robert can get into a little bit more of the construction impacts. What we're seeing here right now is probably one of the more impactful parts of the work, but it's not the total amount of the work. So this, what you're seeing right now, isn't going to last for two months. This is going to be, I think, I think this is approximately two weeks, we're hoping, at the uh, Pike Melrose Minor intersection of, um, that's where we're going to be raising up the intersection and pa paving like half at a time. And so, you know, that's when you're pouring, setting concrete, pouring concrete, setting concrete, stamping it. There's a lot going on there. And so at that time, we can't, we may not necessarily be able to allow uh, through traffic to go, you know, around the zone, at least while we're in active work. Um, but that is not the total, like, you know, two months duration. That should be, you know, like half and half uh, week to week. So that's our expectation on that. And then on a nightly basis, while this is going on, how are customers going to access our front door, Taylor Shellfish's front door? Um, uh, at no time, will it be completely blocked off, right? Sorry, what was that last part? Our entrance will never be completely blocked off, right? You will always have pedestrian access to your front door, definitely. And Linda, again, we'll put those signs out on the on the blocks on the corners that say businesses are open, and and we're gonna try to get custom signs that list the name of all the businesses just to help in increase that visibility, so we can put those signs um, clearly out on the corners so folks know that you're open. Do we want to go to the next yeah. We're gonna move on yeah. to the next one. So then this this image here is just kind of um, in parallel to the one I, I just showed. So this is really focusing on the work at the for the raised intersection. Um, and so we anticipate that when they're really doing this raised intersection, that that, that will require two short term full closures of the intersection and those closures will only last a couple days at a time. Um, we anticipate that they would start, the full closure would start on a Monday at 7 a.m. and that the area, the intersection would be fully reopened by Thursday at 7 a.m. Um, that work would also likely include some nighttime work. Um, so this is really when the contractor is breaking up the existing concrete and then laying the foundation and pouring the new concrete for the intersection. Um, so the noisiest work would happen during the daytime and would include activities like concrete breaking. Um, and then at night, crews would prepare the base for the intersection and pour the concrete. 
Um, again, very early, but we anticipate that they would likely um, on the first two nights pour, uh, do the, from the form of, of the base. And then the last night on Wednesday nights, they would pour the concrete and then open the intersection back up by Thursday morning. And they will do half the intersection at a time. Again, we anticipate they would do half the intersection at a time, and um, which would then require the two closures. So it would be that they would... Um, close it from Monday to Thursday to do half of the intersection. And then that following week would likely close it again, Monday to Thursday to do the other half. Um, so during the period when this work is happening for the raised intersection, we have the full closure. Um, there won't be three traffic on Melrose or Minor. So you can see that we'll have we'll have to close the road there. Um, again, we'll allow local access so you all can get in with your deliveries um, and to help facilitate that, you know, we would restrict parking. We anticipate restricting parking again so that vehicle vehicles can make that turning movement. Um, and there'll be flaggers out on site and um, uniformed police officers to just help with that um, access, that local access for you all. Um, pedestrian access and um, just be there to help with the deliveries also. So Linda, kind of getting circling back to one of your questions about access to your door, when it's looking like this and we've got, you know, kind of a barricade at the pine, pine end of Melrose and of Minor, and we've got uh, flaggers and uniformed police officers, they will be allowing not just deliveries, but like if you have a customer that's in an Uber or, you know, disabled customer or something like that that needs to get to your door, they can allow them up, um, up, up to the door. Um, I'm not sure about parking, maybe like very, very short parking, um, because we do need to keep the area clear for, you know, a, a turn at the end of the closure zone. But, um, but yeah, we, people will still be able to get in for the local trips. And one thing I forgot to mention um, that we know that some delivery trucks won't be able to make that turning movement. And so um, we are also looking to identify an area on Piker Pine that we can reserve for deliveries um, specifically for the vehicles that can't turn around. And that'll be very uh, helpful information if you happen to know um, or can communicate with some of your suppliers about their vehicles. Um, if that's, you know, it, it would be very helpful to be able to, um, for them to know that this is coming and then also to be able to communicate back to us um, and probably Robert, because he will be the one that's on site to be able to sort of like coordinate where, where they need to go. Um, but it'll be helpful if we know that that's, you know, trucks can't make the turn, expect it, where they're coming from, that kind of um, planning. Can we work that in reverse a little bit? Like give us an idea to like, up to what size or what type and what size of truck will be able to make the turn. And then if we could get something from you all that we can send out to all of our suppliers so and give them a heads up on where parking is, where delivery zones are um, for larger trucks and where and how to make deliveries for smaller vehicles. If we could push that out to our suppliers, that would be great because we have we have all ends of the spectrum. And I will add on to this that I've seen that we've successfully in the past had delivery trucks instead of nosing into a closed road, have them back into a closed road with, you know, um, flagger and or uniform police officer assistance. And then then it's easy enough for them to just pull out after they're done doing their delivery. And so that some coordination, you know, with like your larger trucks. Um, I will be on site most of the time. Um, we will, um, getting a little bit ahead here, we, we will have communications on a weekly basis with all of you. We wanna make sure that we know what needs you have coming up and what um, and how we're gonna get through this. It is my full intention to have it be like a rip off a of Band-Aid and get it done as quick as possible. However, I, I, cannot, um, I cannot force the contractor to do anything, but I can definitely encourage them. And I'm definitely going to be encouraging them to do this as quick as possible to reduce the impact on you. And I'll just add, it, it, 
I think we certainly could, Linda, as part of our just coordinating with you all when the time approaches, um, come up with some clear maps and information that show where loading zones will be, the size of those loading zones um, that you can share with your suppliers. And I think too, part of that would be like Robert's contact information if he's the person out on the street who can help potentially even coordinate directly with any of your drivers, just so we know when people are coming and we can just kind of help stagger it so that it's not everybody trying to use the loading zone at the same time. Um, again, we really want to, we'll be there on the ground to help run it as smoothly as we can. Also, when we talked one-on-one, -on -one, I put something in the chat about the nighttime work. Is there some way that, well, first of all, I don't think anyone has anything going on Sunday night. Is I Wasif is closed. Mom Noon is closed. We're closed. Melrose Market wraps up before evening comes around. And it is really every night that construction is going on, it kills our dinner business. So if there's some way to mitigate that, hopefully completely, but if there's night work, like going on all night long, is there any way they can pause from like five to nine or five to 10? And, and to, to gain Wednesday nights or Thursday, yeah, Wednesday nights, would it be possible for them to start on Sunday evening instead of Monday morning and finish on Wednesday by five instead of Thursday by 7 a.m.? It would give us one more night of dinner business without losing a bunch of revenue. Yeah, so I, I'll turn it to maybe Marilyn to speak more on this, but um, what I know is that, you know, since we heard the preference to restrict closures on the weekend, that that's what we set up in the contract. So again, that's what the contractor has built their plans, their construction staging and sequencing plans all around that assumption. Um, and I know too that like the concrete companies that would do a lot of this work, they don't have workers that typically work on weekends. Um, so that's part of the considerations. Um, so I, again, I'll turn it to the construction team, but I think I can say Linda that in the very least, I know that we can, and we will coordinate with you all to do everything that we can to make the most disruptive work happen during the daytime and with the current plan of them doing the work from Monday to Thursday, a lot of the noisiest work would be that concrete breaking, which would happen first. So that would be more like Monday morning time frame, Monday during the day when a lot of you are closed. And then the work at night is more of like the form setting and the concrete pouring. So the intersection will be closed, but the work isn't super disruptive, like loud or um, impactful. So, but if the intersection is closed, I mean, I guess, is there a possibility of a pause during? Uh, can I answer your question? Yeah. Uh, for a Sunday, usually uh, the contract that don't work because the, uh, they have to open the plant. For example, they want to ship the material to the job site. The subcontractor, the, the one to sell uh, steel or material, they don't open on Sunday. If, if uh, they want to do a Sunday night, they have to own, own the plant. So own the plant will cost them the money. And the worker, usually they don't work a Sunday night. They work on the weekdays only, weekday nights. So, um, for the weeknight work, usually uh, they will stop at midnight. And I don't see if we, I don't think we can stop them between five and nine, but they continue continue to work to midnight. So if we if the, if we stop them at five to nine, they don't have enough time left to get the, the work done. So just only three nights, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, you may not have noise because they have to set up for the pool. So uh, typically only two nights, Monday and Tuesday, you will hear the noise. 
but uh, Wednesday you will not hear. I thought the noise was going to be happening during the day because you're telling will, me that, that. Yes, the noise. The noise will be happen on, on the daytime, and they will minimize the noise at the nighttime. But so they they're not have, working all night. They're just working till midnight. Yes, that's the plan. They're working until midnight. They don't work all the way through to uh to the night until the next next morning because they have only two two crews. Yeah, they 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 split into uh the the day crews and the uh, the night. They call the night crews. So they try to get them done by midnight and they they go home. So the second uh, the uh, first shift goes to work at seven. So they wouldn't. Do they ever have crews that work? Instead, like from 10 p.m. to like 6 a.m. So 10 p.m. to 6 p.m. They to 6 a.m. I mean, six, yeah, 6 a.m. They may have it, but we don't know if they schedule it. But we can talk to them if we can accommodate uh, you. We we can it will touch pay with them if we see we can work from that time. But normally they usually they work you know straight from seven. A.M. through three thirty. That's the first shift. The second one coming in from three thirty. They walk like until like maybe like eleven thirty midnight, and they go home. I guess that would be an ask, and I think if any of the restaurant owners want to jump in, but it does impact. We've lived through this construction many times, and just a couple of nights is a lot of revenue loss, um, and especially for those of us that have outside dining and it would be great if instead of working only during our dinner hours, if they did, if they were able to have crews work starting at 10 PM instead of through our dinner service. I'd, I'd like to add something here. Even if they stopped at 5 PM, that area in orange would be a big hole in the ground that they can't drive through anyway. So it would still be closed even if they're not working. So it's either going to be a big hole in the ground or it's going to be filled with concrete that needs to set for a day or so before it can have traffic on top of it. So that's the reason why we're going to be closing that intersection area. Um, so if it's the noise between five and nine, that's the issue, then we can look into that. But um, if it's a matter of just having the road closed in general, um, this is the the tearing the band-aid off, you know, to do the the short term the shortest term possible closure instead of dragging it out for weeks. You sure. know if, so well, that, and I also want sorry, I also wanted to point out kind of the sequencing of the work that Lyle was getting into. Um, in order to prepare for this, there's a lot of very noisy breakup of concrete work. And that's the kind of thing that um, normally we are restricted from doing overnight. That's the stuff we don't get to do overnight. We usually do it during the day. Um, because of noise var noise uh, ordinances. And this does have um, some residential on this block. And so um, the noise ordinances restrict that loud work even, it's, it's restricted on weeknights, of course, but um, it's the hours of work are even more limited on weekends. And so there's just a lot of um, constraints on being able to schedule any work um, on, a on a weekend, let alone, you know, on Sunday night. Um, so, and the kind of work that Lai was talking about, that noisy prep work, that is the preparation work that has to happen for, I think it's like Monday, Tuesday is what the plan is to do two days of that noisy prep work during the day, because we can't do it at night uh, due to the ordinances, the noise variant, noise, noise ordinances, and then to do the pour on Wednesday when, you know, we can do it, uh, do pour it on Wednesday, it's a 24 hour mix that would be set within 24 hours and then be drivable, so that we can then open that by, what is it, late Thursday, I think. So yes. that's kind of the sequence. And we were kind of thinking that through with the feedback that we had gotten before that, you know, like Friday and Saturday night, day night is the, you know, rest, restaurant high hour, you know, and so we wanted to not be doing work um, at those times. What did you want to say, Lai? Sorry. Yeah. So Wednesday, you will see, we you will see minim, uh, minimal construction. Whereas on Wednesday, when they pour concrete, they had to wait for the concrete set up. So basically you see the roadway close, but you don't see a lot of construction activity, you will not hear any noise where they have to wait for a concrete setup before they can open for the traffic. So basically the closer on Wednesday, just wait for the concrete setup on Thursday. So when, when Thursday day, uh, when Thursday about 7 a.m., they will shim the other half of the roadway. 
so they can open the uh, the, the intersection for the traffic. And so, how many weeks of that will will that be? So we think about two weeks. They they do half the intersection as, uh, at the time. So the first week will be one half. The second week will be second half. So basically, you get the noise only Monday and Tuesday. So Wednesday, you will need, you will not hear any noise. And Are you saying that we will or we won't have noise after five p.m. Uh, we think about. Maybe after nine o'clock, you will not hear noise, but because the construction, we don't know exactly what the plan. So if they, the plan, the contractor told me they will break in the payment on the daytime. And at night, they will set it up, but you still hear noise. They may move the material here and there, you may hear noise, but not no, a lot of noise like you hear on the daytime. Not like jackhammering. <laughs> Yeah, that kind of like loud breaking noise. Yeah, they will not hear that. Yep. Mm -hmm. But for instance, you know, an, a, a a large construction vehicle idling, right? That's not like a loud piercing noise, but you can feel the vibration, right? And usually, the vibration is what people um, still feel, and and you know, I, we think of it as being noisy, but it's um it's a, a different level from jackhammering. Yeah, I mean, I don't mean to. It, this is unique to us, but we rely on a rooftop, especially right now with COVID. And you'd be surprised at what little noise affects the diners on our rooftop. And that's that's just us. But it would be, I mean, I think it would be less impact if it took another day, but there wasn't construction going on from like five to nine. And it's, you know, if it's too loud to happen from 10 p.m. to or 9 p.m. to whatever in the morning, then that means it's going to be disruptive for our, for our dinner service. OK, I think that's my two cents. Uh, yeah, I, I think right now, that's a, you know, that's that's a lot of um, even if we lose, say, five or six dinner shifts, that's a lot of income. It's a lot of income for our workers. It's a lot of income for our restaurant. Um, but you know, off the top of my head, that's, that's my thoughts. Okay. Uh, right now, this one just only preliminary. We don't know exactly what's the plan. I've tried to contact the contractor like a couple of times a week, try to ask them what's the plan. So right now, the first, the uh, team to strike. They, they they cannot schedule concrete with anything and they don't know exactly the schedule we don't know we just still up to the air so uh we will note your concern so i will talk to them see if we can find any way we can accommodate uh you know we'll try to reduce noise or not working between fire and night or they can they say they may not need to close at night or something i i will talk to them and i will give you an update you know what the plan right now they don't give me exactly what they want to do, but the information that you have in on on the presentation is based on the traffic control. We think they will do it in phases, like they do the uh, the west side first or the, the east side, and they will move to the uh, the race intersection. That's only our you know um, preliminary. We thinking how the country do it, but but you now when we talk to them maybe approaching the construction, uh, maybe of February, we can talk more about how they do the work. So we will uh, update you and we will we'll try to work with the contract, see if we can um, accommodate your uh, concern. Yeah, I think there's a lot of needles that we're trying to thread here. And I think I hopefully that's kind of apparent. Um, oh, no presentation <laughs> um, of, uh, you know, we're restricted on noisy hours and, and even more so on the weekend. Um, concrete plants are not open, generally not open on the weekend as well. And so, and when we would need to do the concrete pour would be actually like about the third day rather than the first or second day. So the first and second day is the noisy work. Um, and so we're trying to, you know, schedule it when we are able to do it, when our suppliers are do it, when our labor is able to do it. And um, thank you, Drew. And, um, uh, you know, around the noise variances for the residential neighbors around as well as the businesses. And so, you know, we've got a lot of 
people that we're trying to, you know, consider as well. Um, and so I think by what we're trying to do, and I think what Robert has said is, you know, we're trying, we realize this is going to be disruptive. It may be disruptive for, you know, a few nights on two weeks, you know, for this particular work. And so, you know, we'll, we'll try to minimize this as much as possible, but just kind of be prepared that um, there could be some, you know, night work, uh, concrete pouring, whatever, on a weeknight uh, earlier in the week rather than Friday or Saturday, for instance. So we're trying to sort of like find that uh, least impactful, but there, it, there will still be impact to do this. So, but yeah, like I said, we don't have firm plans yet uh, in terms of schedule from the contractor. And so we'll know more as uh, he continues to discuss with them. So. Hi everybody, I'm back. I apologize, my internet went out. Oh, I had a feeling that was gonna happen. Um, well, we just moved to slide 10, so you're right on time. Okay, and are, is it my, I don't think I'm- I'm, sh I'm sharing right now, so you can okay. just let me know when to swap over. You or can. The next, I'll oh. run it from now on. You can just let me know the next slide. Oh, Drew, let, I'll, I'll change here. Okay. Um, oops. Sorry, everybody. Okay. Um, can you all see that okay? All right, so slide 10. Um, so this is then what construction would look like when we do the east side of the street. Um, in this configuration, this is where we would anticipate that um, Melrose would be converted and minor to one way directional. Again, that's largely because of the um, work area here and just to help traffic navigate safely around. Um, again, we anticipate that there would be parking restrictions um, on both sides of the street and that we would have flaggers on site to help um, with local access. So are, if there are any questions on this one, I'll keep moving. Are you really gonna keep that little section in front of the Starbucks two-way? That that looks like a, oh, <laughs> a disaster uh, in the making. Yeah, so I think we were, well, Marilyn, do you wanna, do you wanna chime in? Oh, I, I saw Lai unmute himself too. Did you wanna talk Lai? <laughs> Oh uh, yes, we see. We just go back to the uh, the plan again. This one, the preliminary. Uh, this the TCP we put in the uh, project spec. That's we what we just uh, like. This not exactly what a contractor do. But this one just preliminary. So we can more still modify the the TCP. So I whatever whatever is used in here, probably maybe eighty and ninety percent. Uh, what we would do but we will modify if we need it. I don't think we want two way and that in the section, correct, Marilyn? That we yeah. discussed before. I was gonna say, uh, Bruno, we are thinking the exact same thing actually. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it would be probably a lot simpler um, to just have both Minor and Melrose be southbound at this time. Um, and so again, you know, when we say this is right at the bottom there, preliminary construction plan subject to change, that's one of the conversations we're having with the contractor. And um, and so I think that this one could be one that uh, is adjusted. Um, but, because we are talking about that. We saw this, the exact same thing. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next one which really kind of wraps up our presentation. So I think we've talked about this already, but once construction starts, we will send regular, likely weekly project email updates. So if folks haven't already, please sign up to receive those email updates. You can sign up on our webpage and that QR code on the screen will bring you there. And then for you all, for the businesses here on Pike Pine, um, we, again, really wanna stay closely coordinated with you. Um, and so once construction starts, we will receive each week a three-week look-ahead schedule from the contractor. 
So what we're thinking is that we would like to set up like a virtual meeting with you all at a standing time each week after we receive those schedules so that we can share those schedules with you real time. There'll be final plans um, so that you can know what to expect and we can work together to sort out any issues or concerns that that might pop up once we see those final plans. So that's kind of what we're thinking. And then, of course, in addition to those meetings, we can follow up separately with an email to you all. So if you can't make it to a meeting, you'd still get the information. And and besides that, again, we're just we're here for you and we want to partner with you and work with you. So you can always email us. That email right there goes to the outreach team. So it's a great way. There's several of us that keep an eye on that inbox. So it's a good way to get a hold of us and we can field your questions. Um, that phone number there is to a voicemail line, um, which is just another way you can get a hold of us. And, and I think some of you I know have my direct contact information and perhaps you have Maryland's too. And again, we just really want to maintain open communication with you all to be there, work with you through this. Um, and Marilyn shared parking enforcement updates. So, um, and then lastly, just a reminder of other contacts and resources. There's the information for the project team and then also information for contact information for the Office of Economic Development. So AJ's team, um, they're also here for you um, and can help with a range of services and resources for small businesses. Um, so they're partners with us as well. Um, Candice, if I could, I just wanted to add uh, back on the previous slide when we were talking about our regular weekly uh, meetings with uh, business owners on this block. <clears throat> we, we will be providing you with information, but we also want that to be an opportunity for you to talk to us. And um, my goal, obviously, is to have a conversation, but what I would really love is if, um, if we actually heard from you prior to the meeting, if you're seeing something that's an issue or a concern, let us know before we get together. Um, if you give us a couple of days advance notice, and maybe what we'll do is we'll, you know, set out like a, an, a you know, call for agenda items. Um, let us know at that time, maybe a couple of days before the meeting. Um, what I would really love is to be able to come back to you at the meeting with, with the solution or the answer to your question or issue. Um, so I think that that might make it a really good productive use of that time. Um, and uh, I think that when we get into this weekly routine and rhythm that it, it'll become a little bit more, you know, smooth, smoother so that we all kind of like can anticipate that timing. But I just wanted to put that out there that we want to hear from you as well. Um, I think that that's going to, you know, my, my hope is that that will help us to um, foresee and head off any problems before they become problems or issues before they become a problem. Um, and so that we can really like work together. So um, it may, may take a little bit to get there, but that's our that's our vision and our goal for those weekly meetings. And, uh, you know, while we would like to have one that works for everybody, let us know, you know, if, if we pick a time that doesn't work for somebody, let us know about that. Because I, I, I want to make sure that we stay in communication and that, you know, a, a scheduling conflict isn't the reason why, you know, we're not talking. Yeah, and I think that times that we'll suggest for those meetings will depend on when our project team, the project team will have weekly construction meetings with the contractors. So we'll likely want to set up those weekly meetings with you all after, of course, so that we have the schedule and the information we can share it with you. Sounds great. Thank you so much for all the work you, you're doing. And uh, I, I think, you know, it, we know it's going to be painful and it's not going to be perfect because nothing is, but I really appreciate all the, all the effort to make it as painless as possible. Thanks, Bruno. I second that. Thank you all so Thanks. much. Yeah, so we will be in touch with um, a recap from this meeting with some key points, um, action items, things that we're looking into, and we'll follow up with you all on um, we'll also post this recording so you have it and others have it. Um, and please reach out to us if anything else comes up for you since seeing this information, um, if you have any other questions, and um, we'll, we'll be in touch as we, as we know more from the contractor. So with that, Drew, is there anything left in the chat or hands raised? Or shall we call it a meeting? 
I don't see any new hands raised. I think we circled on the questions. Um, we've got everyone's questions, but if I am forgetting your question, please raise your hand or unmute yourself and give it a quick ask. All right. Well, thank you everyone for the questions that we had before. Yep, thanks everybody.